rebinding stuff in their in their beta release. So kudos to them for that. <coughs> the, as far as I know, they're the only router that actually has an, has any of that in it. So that was awesome. Uh, my favorite though are the Action Tech routers. Anyone here have Verizon, FiOS, or DSL? Wow, that's it. Really? Okay. Well, everybody where I live has Verizon FiOS. And um, I, I, I saw a, um, an article on some business site, I forget where it was now, um, just last week. And uh, Verizon claims that they have 3.8 million FiOS customers now. That's not DSL customers, that's just FiOS customers, internet customers. Um, so I d went ahead and I tested um, a lot of these Action Tech routers. Um, the uh, GT701 and 704 are both DSL routers, and those are distributed by Verizon and Quest. Um, the MI424, there's two of them here. Uh, revision C is on the bottom and Revision D is the one there on the right. Um, those are the uh, Verizon Fios routers. And what's really interesting about the, the Fios routers, these Action Techs, uh, MI424s, is Action Tech doesn't actually make the firmware for them. They actually purchase third party firmware um, called OpenRG, which is a Linux based firmware, uh, from a company called Jungo. And Jungo has partnerships with Linksys and US Robotics and Belkin and obviously Action Tech and others. And they claim that this firmware is deployed in over 23 million households worldwide. Also awesome. <laughs> so we have a really big attack platform. Okay? There's a lot of people out there who are running routers that are potentially vulnerable to this. I mean, again, I only tested 30 routers. There's obviously more out there than that. But just based on the ones that I tested, there are millions of networks out there using these routers. Um, so we, we have to take it a little step further. Now that we've proven the attack works, we have to make it practical. All right? If you just go up to someone and say, oh, I can see your internal login for your router, they're like, who cares? So first of all, we have to make this atta an attack that the attacker can just like fire and forget, a complete drive-by attack. Um, so we have to obtain the router's public IP before they ever do a DNS lookup on us. And that's actually fairly easy to do. But the bigger problem is we have to coordinate all our services. So the DNS server and the web server and the firewall all have to maintain the right state for each client that's browsing to you. And that requires a little custom code. And finally we have to do something useful with it. Once we actually do the rebinding attack, we have to do something useful, something that people will go, holy shit, that's bad. So I went ahead and wrote Rebind, which is probably the most cleverly named tool ever. Um, <laughs> so basically it does everything for you except register a domain name. It runs a web, it actually runs two web servers. Um, it runs the DNS server. It interfaces with the IP tables firewall in Linux. Um, it ser serves up JavaScript code to the client when they do the initial request. Uh, it also implements an HTTP proxy for the uh, attacker to interface with the routers. And basically the HTTP proxy and the JavaScript code act together to um, forward requests from the attacker to the client. The client then sends it to the browser, or the, excuse me, the router. And then the router sends it back to the client and the client sends it back to the proxy and the proxy sends it back to the attacker. <coughs> so I love the robot devil, by the way. He's awesome. Uh, so let's take a look at how this works when an attacker is running rebind. Okay? Again, same scenario. Um, but the attacker is now uh, configured uh, rebind to run on his 1414 server. Now before the attacker can get someone to browse out to rebind, um, he's got to configure his domain. So first of all, he has to register a name server. So if rebind is going to be handling all your DNS lookups, you have to make sure all the DNS lookups come to the, dev to come to the box that you're running rebind from. So the attacker has to go into wherever he registered his um, domain, you know, GoDaddy or wherever, and has to register the 1414 IP as a name server. Just call it, you know, ns1.attacker.com. And then once that's done, goes into his uh, DNS configuration for the attacker.com domain and say, hey, my DNS server is ns1.attacker.com. So this makes sure that all DNS lookups come to the box where rebind's running. So rebind can handle all of the DNS lookups for your domain. So he gets the client to browse out to attacker.com slash init, I-N-I-T. So again, the uh, client has to do a DNS lookup. But at this point, Rebind doesn't know the client's public IP 
Because the, the source IP in your DNS packet that you receive is not going to be the clients. It's going to be some random DNS proxy or caching server. So Rebind's just going to say, oh, I'm at 1414. Gives it one IP address. That's it. B but now the client says, okay, I know where you are, and initiates a TCP connection to port 80 to do the get request. But now that he's connected directly to the Rebind server, the Rebind server says, ah, now I have your public IP. Your public IP is 2358. So what the web server does is it generates a random subdomain of attacker.com and redirects the client to that subdomain. Now the client says, okay, this is an HTTP redirect, no problem. But it's a new subdomain, so I have to do a new DNS lookup. Now he does a DNS lookup on the new subdomain, which, so by the way, WACME was actually a randomly generated subdomain when I was testing. So, yeah, I was like, oh, that's going in the slides for sure. Um, so the client now has to do, do a DNS lookup for whackme.attacker.com. So the DNS server says, aha, I can't really see your, the, the actual client who's making this DNS lookup, but I know the web server just redirected 2358 to whackme.attacker.com. So if you're doing a DNS lookup for whackme.attacker.com, your IP must be 2358. So now he can send back the DNS response packet that has the two IP addresses in it. So again, as before, the browser tries the first one first um, and does the uh, web requests and Rebind sends back its JavaScript code. Um, once the browser has that JavaScript code, Rebind tells the IP tables firewall, block everything coming into port 80 from 2358 with a TCP reset packet. So when the JavaScript attempts the connection back to the Rebind server, it gets a TCP reset packet and now the browser is going to Rebind to the second IP address which is the router's public IP. And so now the JavaScript has interactive access to the router. Now, once this happens, Rebind's, the JavaScript code starts sending um, queries back to port 81 on Rebind because it's, it's still blocked on port 80 so it sends it to port 81. And basically these are just pull requests saying, hey, what do you want me to do? And at this point Rebind doesn't have anything for it to do so it's not going to send back anything. Um, but once these pull requests start coming back, the attacker sees the IP address pop up in the web interface. So all he has to do is click on that IP and his request is going to go through the Rebind HTTP proxy. So Rebind says, okay, you want me to do a GET request on the index page for 2358. No problem. So it holds the connection open to the attacker's browser and when the next pull request comes back from the JavaScript, it says, yeah, I have something for you to do. Do a GET request. And so the JavaScript does a GET request, gets a response, sends the HTML code and the HTTP headers back to the Rebind server which forwards it on to the attacker's browser and now the attacker sees the web page in his uh, web browser. He can click around and submit forms and pretty much do whatever he wants at that point. So demo time. Now it's <laughs> So the best way to find bugs in your code is to do a live demo. Um, I, I found a really fun one in, my in the middle of my Black Hat demo. Um, so we'll see if it com crops up again here. Um, but so I've already have the Rebind um, server running on this box here. Um, this other one is my internal client. This is the Action Tech Verizon FiOS router. Um, so as an attacker, all you have to do is once you've configured your browser to use Rebind as your HTTP proxy. Just type in rebind and you get the web, let me see if I can full screen for this so it looks a little better. Yeah, so you get the, get the web interface there. So I'm going to get my client to browse out to the attacker.com domain and we should see him pop up over here. Hey, there he goes. All right, so now if I click on him, I should get the, uh, inter the main page for the router. So that's the internal web interface for the router. Now, the Action Tech firmware, the firmware that runs here is actually kind of kind of smart. It forces you to change the password, so trying to prevent like default passwords, but all of the Verizon techs change the password to password one and no one ever changes that password. So we click OK and we should get, hey, we're in.
So you only have this access for as long as the client's on your page. So it behooves you to go into the advanced settings and enable remote administration. <laughs> and there are like seven pages you have to click through on this stupid firmware to do that, but that's okay. Yes, I want to proceed. Thank you. <coughs> so I'm going to go ahead and re enable remote telnet. <sighs> and hopefully, yeah, here we go. Okay, so the settings have been changed. We're done here. We've enabled remote telnet on that box. And the login is the same, admin password one. Now this gives you this wireless broadband router shell. Just type in shell and you get root. So, how, how, am I, how am I doing on time, by the way? Where's my, where's my guy? How am I doing on time? How many? Awesome. Okay. So I got time to do a little bit more with this. So these routers run Linux underneath, right? And they don't have a lot of really good tools on them like netcat or wget. Some of them do, but this particular one doesn't. Um, so I went ahead and cross compiled a quick scanning slash TCP connect tool to run on the uh, ARM based processor that this thing has. And you don't really have a whole lot of networking tools, but you do have TFTP. Oh, yeah. So I just TFTP'd down the tools. I'll just mod it here real quick. All right, so now I can go ahead and scan IPs and ports on this, on this internal network. And really, you can cross compile anything you want and put it on here. Um, they act the Action Tech guys actually do release um, some of their uh, tool chain tools for doing that. Um, so if you want to see a list of internal clients, of course you can just do ARP uh, and there we see our one internal client, 192.168.14. So we can do a uh, quick scan on that one. All right, so he has port 80 open. So now you can just do a get request to port 80. Yeah, and you get whatever page is running on there. So you now have full access to the LAN and all those cool LAN attacks that everyone's like, oh, that doesn't affect me because I have WPA2. Yeah, you can do those. It's fun. All right, but another important note is we're not really necessarily restricted to the main web interface. We can go after SOAP protocols too. So universal plug and play, which how many people here have it enabled for their Xbox or their VoIP? Yeah. It doesn't require any authentication and lets me punch holes through your router all day long to internal clients. And we can interact with that using this attack. So even if you have a, you know, strong password on your web interface, you're still not necessarily secure. Um, HSNAP is another SOAP protocol you'll find on some routers. It's the home network administration protocol. Um, I've only ever seen it on Linksys and uh, D-Link routers. It's, it's kind of a Cisco thing. Um, but you can interface with that as well. It does require a login, but I've, some, inter some implementations have been found to allow you to basically reconfigure the router without a login. So it's just another avenue of attack. Um, we can also rebind, like I said, to any public IP. I mean, I'm obviously targeting routers because it's super fun. But we can rebind to anything. I can basically turn your browser into an on-demand botnet for me and proxy all of my, you know, web attacks through you. So guess whose IP address shows up in the server logs that I'm attacking? Not mine. So how do we protect ourselves? This way will work, um, but you're not going to have much fun on the internet. Um, so first of all, you have to identify if you are vulnerable. Basically, if you can punch in the public IP of your router and you get the router login or the web interface, this attack will work. Because like I said, 